Hello and a very warm welcome to another session of The Change Exchange. My guest today, Justin Bonello, um, TV chef, uh, author of several cookbooks, inveterate traveller, and also father, husband. Cook, traveller, dust kicker, now... filmmaker and <laughs> gardener. <laughs> now a very active gardener and we'll, mm. we'll get to that. I want to start your story right at the beginning. Um, two things in your childhood would come together later in your life. The first one was your grandmother giving you a pan when you were seven. Yeah, oh, Ruda, you know, um, my, phone, my mom and dad used to travel quite a bit and, and Granny Liz would come down from Pretoria and would, and would look after my sister and I. And she taught me how to make crepes um, when I was seven years old and I still have the same pan now. And in fact, my seven-year-old son, Sam, has learned how to make crepes on the same pan, and Gabby, my four-year-old daughter, will as well. And it's important because um, I like to think of children in, in urban environments as part of what I call the forgetting generation, because if you don't pass knowledge across to them, they generally never pick it up again. So if you don't teach them how to grow their own vegetables, cook their own food, that disconnect and that forget becomes a bigger and bigger problem, not only for them, but for their children one day as well. So They think you know. vegetables grow in woodies. Well, exactly. not grow, just yeah, are. Come shrink-wrapped in <laughs> polystyrene, you know, and, and yeah. that's the wrong thinking. And I think all parents have an, an obligation to make sure that their children don't forget. But many people bake with small children, and mm. the small children do not go on to be cooks. Um, why did you retain it? Why was it important in your life? Um, why did it become important in your life? Ruda, actually it was um, when I was growing up we, we travelled a lot as, as kids. The school holidays, the long weekend, every weekend we went away either to the Breda River or up to the wild coast to the Trans Sky. And um, my cook's journey really started out of having to understand or, or know the necessity of how to prepare nature's bounty. So, you know, in the beginning when I was younger there were lots of terrible experiments, raw, sandy, overcooked, burnt, that sort of thing. But so you learn as a cook, you know, you've got to pay the school fees and um, that's where it started. Then when we started going away in my late teens, I was always the guy who cooked because I had this knowledge that I'd built up over the years. And you must have enjoyed it, otherwise you wouldn't have stepped into that well, role. Well, I mean, you know, um, Cooks can be rock stars, you know, you can be the center of attention in, in many <laughs> respects, you know, you've got friends, uh, I mean, friends who dive and spearfish and, and can harvest from, from nature's bark could do that, and then you could cook it as well. And even then, in those sort of formative years of my cooking journey, um, my friends had started forgetting how to cook, you know, that mm. knowledge hadn't been passed on that would have traditionally gone from grandmother and mother to son mm. or daughter. So I held them onto it fiercely mm. so that... Um, I was the cook. But the other strand that would later become important was your mother's profession. She was a tele television producer and you worked as a runner, yes. as a gopher, as everything. Ruda, I have these memories in, 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 ch in childhood of um, being in the Tankwa Karoo with um, Marnie van Rensburg, Greta Fox, Brian O'Shaughnessy, Ian Roberts, and they, they used to film those Afrikaans yes. uh, movies <laughs> back in those days, Fispil the Lenta, Anna. I was on those sets as a kid. Um, Brian O'Shaughnessy taught me how to play poker, you know, and you know, he's dead now. But th that was my journey so many years ago. So um, my mom at that time was doing continuity on movies and then she had moved up the food chain and eventually became a producer. So by the time I was 14, I was running on commercials and um, at the time it was great, you know. I think the, the film industry can be a, kind of siren to in some respects, you know. She's very appealing. But um, after a while, I sort of got to a point, I was carrying crane weights and, you know, they weigh 10 kilograms each and you walk, I was walking down a beach with crane weights and the director had a shot in his mind somewhere down the beach. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm selling. And why? Yes. What is this? And at 19 or 20, I said, no, that's enough, thanks. And I actually got out of the film industry. I didn't see any sense in, in selling the unwanted to the unwashed. <laughs> oh, you're a snob. <laughs> <laughs> But then you tried oh, IT. It's a, such a silly story. I, mean, I actually wanted to be an animator. And um, my sister wanted to study fine art, and my dad said, that's fine. I said, I want to do fine art, and he was like, not a chance in hell. It was that sort of stereotypical things that the, the men in the family had to, to focus on things that were more business-orientated. 
you wouldn't be able to provide. Yes, that mm. sort of mindset. So I went to, to CPUT and I studied information system analysis and design on the hope that it would get me into animation and it didn't pan out that way. And I ended up after completing my studies working in a dark room wearing a suit and tie and I was a miserable person. You know, I'd grown up in the outdoors and I was boxed into this little space staring at a screen and I realized that wasn't for me. There's more, huh? There's, I've got like a whole journey. This, the, the, it, my life has been quite strange and bizarre and, and a series of uh, probably unfortunate events or serendipitous events depending on which way you look at them. So how, what ended the IT stretch? IT, I was asked to design a, a system for a clothing company, a, a database to manage their order stock taking systems, etc. And I, I spent two years doing that and then um, was offered an opportunity to go on my own. And I was 25, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed and knew everything about business. And um, it took me three years to lose everything that I had. Um, <laughs> It was, uh, I, you know, I had a supplier who um, wasn't very ethical and um, I'll never forget, he, he owed me 500,000 Rand back then and I sat in his office, my grandmother had just died, and I said to him, just pay me my money. And the next day they phoned me and said, uh, come collect your, your check and, and I went, we still, check, we still use checks in those days, went in to collect my check and um, the accounts clerk said, no, you've got to go and pick up your returns and I was in, in the clothing industry. And I, there were just boxes and boxes and boxes and it, it, about a half a million rands worth of returns. And uh, the advice I got at the time from my attorneys was you can fight this and it can take a lot of time. So they gave you the returns yeah, instead yeah, of the check? Yeah, they gave me a small check and a, a large amount of returns. And um, I tried to trade out of it. But you know, when you don't pay your creditors on time, um, mm. you lose your credit, then everything turns to cash. And it wasn't much longer after that that I lost everything. House, cars, friends. Um, well, they weren't friends. So the friends, the true friends, the remain friends. What's that like? How does one go through that and come out the other side? Aruda, you know, if it hadn't been for my, my mom and my sister and, and my dad, I, probably, mm -hmm. I actually thought about killing myself at the time, which was a, a really silly thing to, to think about. You know, you think that your world revolves around how you are financially, and that's, and that's not really the truth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if it hadn't been for the support of my mom and sister and dad and things, I wouldn't be here today. And it's silly because it's not the be all and end all. Yeah, but that's what it looks like from where you are now. Now, sure, yes. listen, but when you're in that tunnel, it can be really dark, you know, yeah. and it was like that. But then again, you know, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't gone through that. And, and in life, you're the sum of the good, the bad and the ugly. And, mm -hmm. and yes, when you're in that dark place, it's difficult to see that. But I wouldn't have become the person I am if I hadn't gone through that journey. Mm. And it's why I got back into the film industry. So, you know, there was a positive, but... Um, if you say that's why you got back into the film industry, was that just something so you knew I, and there I, was a possibility? So IT was so fast moving that in the years I'd been in the clothing industry, I'd become a dinosaur. So um, I didn't have the skill set that was applicable in market anymore. And the only place I knew to go back to was the film industry. And, and you know, I love the film industry. There's one thing about it that really is amazing. And it doesn't care your color, color creed or religion. It doesn't care your background. It doesn't, all we care about in the film industry is work. Yes. And I worked. So You do I, the job. You deliver the product. That's yeah. fine. And um, so I ended up um, working as a, a catering team leader for a catering company. And I mean... In the film industry, a unit manager's hours are terrible. A catering team's hours are even worse. You know, we can be in the kitchen at 2 o'clock in the morning yes. and finish at 10, 11 the next night. And um, I did that for a while. And uh, I, I didn't really enjoy it. You know, factory food, uh, in some just churning mm. the stuff out and feeding huge big crews and things wasn't really um, what I envisaged for my life as, as, a, as a budding, I guess, foodie in those days. And I started... Um, a unit assisting on, on sets uh, underneath the unit manager and um, one day we were doing a, a big television commercial in town and um, for Discovery Channel and uh, the unit manager's sister died in a car accident and they bumped me up to, to the unit manager to run the job and then there was no looking back for me and I was a, a unit manager and it was while I was um, a unit manager that um, I watched an episode of Jamie Oliver and he did this, this great meal and then he invited the council workers in from the street. 
And I was like, who would do that? Invite a complete stranger into their house to break bread and things. That's not the South African way. So I, I got together with all the film industry friends I had and I said, I want to shoot a pilot. And I went off and shot a pilot. Were you still cooking privately? No, in my own capacity. I was, but you I, knew that you could oh, do yes, this? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that's what I did. Yeah. I was, um, you know, you always want that um, person in your group of friends that cooks and loves cooking and, mm. and breaking bread, etc. Yeah. So okay, that so was always underneath uh, everything I was doing. And the experimenting hadn't stopped. And the understanding of food uh, it evolved um, mm. quite considerably. But so you shot a, a pilot, pilot for, with no idea of where you're going no, to take it? Nothing. I just had the idea. And it was about celebrating what I thought was the way that most South Africans did it, um, what they did on weekends. So, you know, go away with a group of friends, cook, eat, be merry, drink too much. And um, I sent it around the world, including South Africa, to the SABC, the BBC, the ABC, American Broadcasting Corporation. Again, being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and not yeah. understanding how the industry worked was, I think, a, a fortuitous place to be in because I, I didn't know there were any rules. And, um, the and you had nothing to do, really. Nothing whatsoever. Yeah. You know, I had already um, put my proverbial <clears throat> on the block and I um, was going to go for it. And the BBC wrote back, David Whelan from the BBC wrote back and said, if you produce the series, I'll take it. So he committed to um, a pre-sale and, and I borrowed money from my mom. And <laughs> I went and shot the, the first season of Cooked. Still paying her back that initial money, by the way. <laughs> moms, moms are amazing. And um, the rest is history, you know. I've now done um, I don't know, 30 odd television shows. Some I've hosted, um, most of them I've created. Um, you might recognize some of them, everything mm -hmm. from Charlie's Cake Angels to a series called The Ride to a series with Rion Mansa, um, Bear Country, Terroir, lots of shows. And I'm proud of them, you know, mm -hmm. I think in, in some respects um, through the shows that I created, I was um, becoming an ambassador for South Africa to the world. And, mm -hmm. and indeed those shows have been on air in every country in the world from South America, America, uh, Asia, East, uh, BBC, Discovery, Nat Geo. The whole lot. Yeah. And, um, mm. When was there a moment when you knew that this was now a business that would live? Because in the beginning, it's just you, and you're just doing no, your little thing. And even thing. even now, you know, the South African film industry is a really tough one. You know, yeah. we've got um, we've only got three broadcasters. SABC, as you know, is in turmoil yet again. Um, ETV's got a different focus to the mm. type of content that I produce and Mnet in back in the day was quite focused on its content and what it did. So to produce content here and then you've got to bear in account you've got 11 official languages and all sorts of things where the rest of the world doesn't care about any of that. Mm. So it was quite a difficult place because we didn't have a local home and we had to create content that um, would appeal to an international market. And primarily the work was, I've got shows that have never been seen in South Africa. You know, I did a, a six part series on the Karoo, it's never been seen here. Mm. And that makes me quite sad because I, I do, mm. I love this country. I celebrate it in every inch of my being and um, that there were these um, hurdles in the way that uh, looked at people differently was, it's unnecessary, you know, at the end of the day, mm. we're all exactly the same. We just want a, a roof over our heads, be able to put food on the table, put our kids through school, you know, have a little bit of money in the bank account. And um, mm. it does doesn't the, have to be like that. Does the web open up new possibilities that you can put that kind of stuff, at it, least put it out there once it's paid its way? Yes, most definitely. And, and I've started mm. dabbling in that. Um, and it's quite an interesting space, but it's how do you economize it again? You know, so yeah, no. sort of YouTube yeah. wants you to have a billion people watching it before you sort of start making any money out of it. Um, you know, Netflix and co that have come back into the South African market have really created quite a disruptive space. And, um, and that's driven by metrics because they know mm. what people are watching, when they're watching it, what type of shows they're watching, and then they can commission shows um, that appeal to the market. And, and they've recently approached us in South Africa. And it's interesting because they always look for something that's a flagship show in the country that's, that's produced by local producers, that has international legs to mm. sort of jumpstart the, the local film production community with Netflix. So it could be interesting to see where it goes. 
Um, yes, online is, is of a help, but it's also quite a cluttered space now, and I'm sure you feel some of that as well. You're bombarded by Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp mm. and your emails and, and all these other platforms, and it's quite overwhelming. You know? <laughs> yes. I don't think I've put a tweet out and tweet out in eight or nine months. Yeah. I just don't have capacity anymore, and I don't think anyone has capacity to listen to all of it anymore. No, I you, you have don't. to narrow it down, yeah. Mm. Um, in how long has it now been since you made that first show? About 15, I'm 47 now. Yes, yeah, it's about 15, 15 years. 16 years ago. Yeah. yeah. What have you learned? Not just, I mean, of course you've learned content, mm. but personally, about it's been a really busy <sighs> 17 years. I'm, I'm still learning. And the worst part about my own personality was that I'm a, I'm a viper. I tend to react to situations too quickly. And my close friends will tell me a number of times that I must rather be the boa constrictor and slowly <laughs> strangle them versus reacting so fast. That's the one thing. I am um, his control. Me personally, I, um, I used to react too hard and too fast. And uh, even I was at a... Um, a, a, a safety talk in Ocean View on, on Monday or Tuesday night, and um, the, um, one of the guys from school, the school safety program stood up and they were talking about how they've put uh, security guards at a school in, in uh, a high school in Ocean View, but the crime hotspot is opposite a primary school. And I was like, how can you have it there and not over there? What are you doing about that? When it wasn't the forum for it, I should have discreetly written him a mail afterwards and said, what are you doing? <laughs> So if that journey continues, then it's about people. Mm -hmm. You know, good people mean good things. Um, surround yourself with kings and queens, and you will always be royalty. You know, but if you surround yourself with rubbish, that's what you're going to have in your life. In fact, I read a post somewhere this morning which spoke about how children that surround themselves, you can tell a lot about people by the people that they surround themselves mm -hmm. with. So I'm, I'm a lot more cautious than I used to be in the early days. I have a tiny group of really good friends around me that, that are my support system. And yeah, people are, that's the most important thing. Mm. And all the rest of it is superfluous. Uh, tell me about your, your new venture, um, Neighborhood Farms, oh, are you calling it? Yes. Yeah, and how did you get into that and why and what do you Nothing. want to achieve? That's a really long story. So uh, a couple of years ago, I, I formed a series in, in conjunction with one of the local retailers and it, it was an, an exploration into the food production facilities in South Africa. So everything from aquaculture, vegetable farms, um, cold storage, the whole lot, feedlots. And um, on one of them, I met a farmer in, in Pearson called Roy Heidenreich, who was um, um, practicing predator-friendly methods um, around his Angora goat production. And he was suffering, you know, um, pre-putting in the Anatoly dogs and mimicking the, the, the grazing patterns of migrating springboks, etc. His losses were ridiculous. And we put the Anatoly dogs in, and his losses reduced by 93% or something like that. Then I was introduced through that conversation to... Um, uh, Dr. Bull Smuts uh, runs the Landmark Foundation, and he was doing a lot of uh, predator conservation work, especially around leopards in, in the Bavians Kloof. And um, I then started uh, speaking to farmers in the Karoo. Um, I was trying to understand what's going on with our farmers in, in South Africa, and it's a very simple equation, actually. And, and I sound like I'm jumping all over the place, but there is a, a, a point to this. In the old days, farmers and consumers were connected like this, um, if we mm. weren't the farmers ourselves. And, and what's happened over the ensuing years mm. is that there's become this huge divide. But it's an economic scale at the same time, so consumers are paying what they should be, but the pressure is always pushed backwards onto the farmer. And they're the most important people in our lives, so, you know, no farms, no food. You never hear about a seventh generation doctor, teacher, lawyer, any of that, only a seventh generation farmer. It's not unusual for a great-grandfather to finish a project that a great-grandson started off. Mm -hmm. But we are marginalizing them. And in fact, um, that same farm that I was on as a nine-year-old uh, child, it's called Elansfle, uh, in the Tankwa Karoo that, this, that those movies were filmed on. And incidentally, um, in Dennis Raitz's book where he writes about finding this oasis in the Tankwa Karoo, it's the same farm. Kubis van Ho, the farmer, said to me, Justin, 20 years ago, 200 lambs to market, bought me a new bucky. 
200 lambs to market today, doesn't pay the deposit on the bucky. What has happened to what I do that I'm worth so little? And they were quite scary words for me. And I understand. I know that's what's happened to the farmer. They've, they've lost the centralized abattoirs. Uh, the, sorry, they've lost the small town abattoirs in favor of centralized ones. Animals have to travel further. Mm. Um, they grade the farmer's meat, so it doesn't matter what effort he's put into them, etc., and knows what he's done. He doesn't get value for what he's done. Then I started coming across real predator conflict, um, farmers protecting their livelihood, and, and that was happening because they were um, reduced margins, they were farming in areas that, that they, they hadn't farmed in uh, traditionally. Um, when the ANC came into power, they introduced a great concept, but not very well thought out, called tenure, which was based on the principle that if you'd lived on farmland or a farmhouse, you would be able to stay there for the rest of your life. But what happened across the board, across the entire of South Africa, was that people who had worked on farms for generations with those same families were literally kicked off the ground. And you can go to any small town in South Africa today and you'll see a huge informal settlement. It doesn't matter where it is. And those were people mm. that were traditionally housed, clothed, fed on farms. And at that point, they got introduced to drugs, gangsterism, etc. But in terms of the predator conflict, we lost the shepherds off the ground. And that's the only real cure for, for predator conflict is to have, have someone on, there, someone on the ground. And that's mm. how our, our great grandparents and things looked after their animals. They mm. didn't have animals just roaming out in the wild and they had far more wild animals out there. That's how they protected their livelihood. But I started thinking is like, how do you work towards saving those wild and rural spaces? And um, I realized the problem was not there. The problem was us in urban environments. You know, the pressures for all wild and rural environments come from cities. So I started breaking apart cities, and uh, we know that 70% of the world's population is going to, to live in urban environments, and indeed in South Africa by 2030. 70%? 70, yeah. Mm. It'll probably be more. And that's actually a good thing, because it's taking people out of rural spaces, mm. but concentrating them in, in urban environments. And the city's a really strange environment. It's the biome that humans created for themselves. Um, they are centers of culture, education, learning, hospitalization, that where we live, that where we bring up mm. our children. But we don't actually know how to live in them. And the longer we live in them, the greater the disconnect and the forget becomes. So it becomes a worst case scenario for us because we become so alienated from wild and rural environments and how we grow our own food that we assume the, the modern production cycle and retailers and things is the status quo. And it doesn't have to be like that. So I said, whatever I did would have to work in cities. It would have to work with children. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm getting long in the tooth now, I'm 47. And I see my own efforts with my own children and teaching them about um, the outdoors, about growing their own food. And Indeed, children across cities should be the agents for change into the future, and we have to give them the tools to understand how they can live a, a better life. And, and that's not only um, about edible education, it's not only about giving them a space where they can have a, an outdoor classroom, where they can connect every subject that they study to, to the outdoors. It's about showing them the processes, how food is grown, how it's harvested, and then showing them how the food moves from farm to shop. And then okay, so to dinner how table. does this play out in practice? <laughs> it's I know, not, it's so difficult. Don't... It's the how, the why, the what, the everything. Okay, so how it plays out is um, in neighborhood farm, um, I put a, a, a business case in front of the, the Premier and the Department of Agriculture, and it was a very basic premise. Nine-tenths of all projects at schools fail for two reasons, uh, food-based projects. They are not economized, so... Um, do-gooders put lots of money into mm. spaces and then they want to give the produce away. Secondly, they rely on the parent-teacher body to run or maintain them. And with respect, educators have enough on their plate as it, mm. as it is. And parents in urban environments are really under pressure. So if you're going to create anything that's around food-based gardens at schools, you've got to economize them and you've got to manage them. So Economize uh, in the sense of monetize. They must pay their way. They must pay their way. The oh. produce must be sold. Mm. And um, we, myself and my co-founder, Eric, spent a lot of time looking at um, market gardens. And the market gardens have been around in, in the human's history for the last couple of hundred years. That's how we've grown food. 
So we realized that you needed a, a 1500 square meter market garden of bare minimum size to be able to um, pay for its own input, ongoing maintenance, oh. kind of labor costs, etc. Um, and then we had to scale that up to a much bigger uh, number. So we've got over six and a half thousand square meters of market gardens running at the moment. At right. how many oh, I know, I sound like I'm all over the place. So our first garden was at, at Cormacke Primary School. We broke ground in March. We planted on the 18th of April. We had our first harvest at the end of June. That garden has produced over two tons of organic vegetables produced at the school um, since June. We then um, put in a, a slightly bigger one at the False Bear Hospital. And it's important because your, your, your schools and your hospitals up and your libraries and things are heart, should be hearts of your community. We put in a bigger one at the False Bear Hospital. We planted that one on the 10th of July. We did our first harvest this week. We put a two and a half thousand square meter of garden up at um, last called Port Craylum. And um, that was planted this week, or harvest at the end of September. But if it's um, a financially viable, yeah. um, almost a business unit, yeah. under professional management, yeah. how are the kids involved? How do you teach the kids? Okay, sure. So um, we had a first focus on the economic heart of the project. The promise that mm. we made to the Premier was is that this project would be economically sustainable with, mm. with no support from anyone else and in fact would be able to expand. So we had to focus on the market gardens first. Simultaneously though, we were putting in the permaculture gardens, the outdoor classrooms, etc., at the schools as well. So a tangible link between the market gardens and the outdoors and the educators and the subjects so that children could study in the outdoors with the market garden. But this and depends on teachers, teachers knowing what to do and wanting to do sure. it. But not necessarily, because there's a, a number of MPOs who've been doing really good work. And, and when we founded um, our MPO, we said we didn't want to be stepping on anyone else's toes. We didn't want to have to become masters of skills that we didn't have. And in permaculture, there's a principle called integrate, not segregate. So we didn't want to take anyone out. It was about how do we utilize existing organizations that are doing good work to complement what we're doing. So whether it's the Seed Foundation, Soil for Life, Trees for Africa, why don't we work together? And I mean, that's what Ubuntu is about. Why do we have to try and own the whole world? That's a sort of capitalistic mindset that says you must control everything. Actually, in social enterprise, you want to work with each other towards a common goal. So, um, so did they come in and teach they the will be, children? Ruta, they will be, yes. Oh. And again, it was, a, it was a timing issue. We first had to secure the, the economic viability mm. of the project. You know, if, if money grew on trees, we'd be millionaires, but it doesn't. And we have an obligation to all the people that we employ locally to make sure that their salaries are paid at the mm. end of the month, pay the management team, etc. Now that that's established, our focus switches to the most important part of the conversation, which is how do you make children agents for change into the future? And I have a question for you, Ruda. What's your first memory of growing something? Well, I grew up in a rural area and my, I suppose it's, it's not growing something myself, it's harvesting oranges and selling them at the side of the road. <laughs> An entrepreneur early on. Nine tenths of people will tell you the bean. That little bean that we wrapped in cotton wool or at where school. you watch. Oh yes, yes, yes. And yes, we nine did. tenths yeah. of people. You you one of a handful who don't or yeah. have responded differently. The premier's uh, first memory was being in a greenhouse with her horticulturalist grandmother. So she caught me out in some respects. <laughs> but nine tenths of people will say the bean. Yes. Now tell mm -hmm. me about your standard sex biology lesson and plant structure. But you will remember the bean. Yeah. And that's the, the critical thing about mm -hmm. what I think of as edible education. You know, when children are learning about geography and they're in the outdoors and they're seeing the sun's mm -hmm. inclination mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the change of that from summer to winter and why does the southwest blow in summer and the northwest before the big storm and that sort of thing, then you hold on to that information. And indeed, every subject in the world is drawn from the outdoors. Doesn't matter, maths comes from it, geography, mm. science, chemistry, they're all drawn from the outdoors. Now I can you just see make that this real. is really, I mean, this is where you want to be now. Um, mm. You've said to me earlier that you can't carry on living at the pace that you're doing. Mm. Um, 
why? What, what is, what's bringing that change? You've done it for the past 20, 25 years, but you say you just, you, I, you, you have know, to make a change now. I, I'm, I'm busy writing my, my eighth book at the moment. It's called Rethink. And, and one of the, the subjects that I delve into is, oh, I've lost my head for a moment. One of the subjects that I delve into is, is how we've allowed ourselves to have the wool pulled over our eyes. And um, a, a prime example is um, free-range chicken. You know, the, we have this thought that free-range chicken is it's better for us, and then we'd buy free-range chicken over battery chickens. They're still slaughtered at 42 days as a chicken. Um, if you read the label carefully, it doesn't say that there's nothing in there. It says no routine growth promoters or antibiotics are given. It doesn't say it's not there. And it was tied into things like we spend more time watching cooking shows nowadays than actually cooking. And I was guilty of um, showing a lifestyle to people which was entertaining, I have no doubt, but was almost alienating people from food even more. So I would look at this plethora of cooking shows that are out there and you're seeing a guy use foie gras foam and something from here and something from there. And the average person can't replicate it or even match up to what those people are cooking anymore. And I believe the end result is, is that they walk into the supermarket and they buy a pre-made meal. And I'm guilty of pushing that story. Now I'm responsible to, to sort of wind back the clock and create a better space. And in terms of how that will um, play out in, in practice in your life, in terms of will you still get up at 3 o'clock every morning and work until 8? You have two young children. You have said that you want to so spend time with them. I am. And, you know, it's, the irony is I, I measured the other day the amount of quality time I spend with my children. And I think I'm just as guilty as, as most parents are nowadays. And it worked out to less than 10 minutes in a day. Quality time. Mm. And I think it is. You finish work, you, you're tired, just need, I need a little bit of space, and, oh, and suddenly it's 8 o'clock and they're in bed. And, and then you take them to school and they're gone. And then the weekend you're recovering so much. Yes, I will work from 3 o'clock in the morning. And I am a workaholic, but um, when you're leading with your heart, it doesn't feel so bad. Mm. I mean, listen, I go to bed at 8. I am, I'm still getting a, a good couple of hours sleep every night. Mm -hmm. Is it sustainable? I don't know. I've been burning the candle on both ends for so long that um, it's embedded in who I am. I've had some health scares in the last couple of months. I had a 175 over 140 blood pressure, and that's heart attack in space. And, and about a month ago, again, it was 145 over something, I forget. And I look at them as warning signs mm. for myself and for my health and, and my life, that if I don't change uh, elements of my life, um, you know, I'll be, um, I'll have a bunch of friends standing around me, sort of waving me goodbye in a coffin, you know, and that's not what I want. And for you my won't children, be there. And I won't be there <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So no, it's not sustainable. But you know, I think the the work ethic is sustainable. You know, you've got to if, anything that you do, you've got to put the, the effort into it. There's no um, easy ride, and. In social enterprise, you almost are more obligated to do good and be squeaky clean than in any other space. You know, if you're using grant or donor funding and things, you have an obligation to deliver to society. But the reward could be really amazing. You know, if, if I can change enough people's thinking or that government takes the program that I've created on as policy and implements it at the 15 odd thousand schools in South Africa and that we create a whole new generation of children who think differently, if we create local employment opportunities, mm. if we create the local well-being economy. And it's happening already. So, I mean, I've seen it. Um, uh, I had Alan Wendy at, um, at the farms last night. He phoned me up at about 5 o'clock and said, I, I've got a, an, an hour before I've got to be in an engagement in Simonstown. Can you show me the farms? And I took him through to, to Cormacki Primary. And we've got a little shop. It's not very big. It's three, three square meters by three square meters. And the, the thing I was most proud to show him was um, the bread in the shop. Because when we, we opened it, and our produce moves 50 meters from, from the garden into the shop, and the local community buys it, 
there's bread that's baked in Masipumalele on our shelves. And the baker's name is Vincent. And he walked into this little vegetable shop and he said, I'm a baker from Masipumalele. Can I sell my bread here? And that was my dream. Mm. In our lifetimes, we've seen the death of the butcher, the baker, and the, and the candlestick maker. And it's all being replaced by generally large corporations who don't have our well-being um, at heart. Generally, um, it's an extractive process. It's focused on drawing as much money as they can out of us and funneling that money into the handful of a few shareholders. And I think corporates have a bigger obligation to actually start investing in society instead of treating us like cows to be strip mined. But Vincent was the prime example of how local well-being economies can be created. He has a space where he can sell his bread mm. to an affluent community member mm. and you're creating employment and entrepreneurial mm. opportunities in an under-resourced or poor community. And that sort of thinking, I think, is where we have to go going mm. forward. We have to create mm. social enterprises that actually focus on you and I and our neighbours and our larger communities to create a better space for all of us. And we have that power. Your wife, Eugenie, is also very much involved in this whole enterprise. Uh, tell me how you met. Oh, I, she's going to hate me. I always <laughs> joke that she stalked me. I um, just finished filming. Um, a You're a very lucky man, if that's uh, the hey? case. <laughs> no, I just finished um, post-producing the first season of Cooked and Re, and I, I took all the crew out for a drink, and there was this girl in the corner, and I didn't pay too much attention and things, and then I had couple more drinks and we went to another another pub down the road and there she was again and by the time I saw her at the third, third place I'd had a, a, enough I had some Dutch courage in me and I was ready to talk to her and I said to her um, would you like to come and walk um, my dogs with me tomorrow and um, she <laughs> said no initially and then I, I sort of begged and um, she eventually gave me her phone number and um, Lo and behold, the next day I got mugged, my phone got stolen and the whole thing, and I had no way of, of contacting her and things. And you know, when you don't, when you say to a woman you're going to phone her and then you don't, yes. you're in, you're in no, trouble. That's the end of it. And it took me t uh, two or three weeks to, to find her and her phone number, and, and by which stage she had sort of brushed me off, he didn't bother contacting me. Anymore. How did you find her, if it was and just a stranger and a phone number? I went through all my friends and... <laughs> a guy called, um, who was a, I forget, the Steadicam operator, um, said to me, no, I think I know who you're talking about and things. And then even worse, I, did, I mean, life is, is, you know, six degrees of separation is rubbish, is way less. <laughs> I then found out she was a, an editor, and my mom, who was a producer, had used her as an editor on commercials that they had worked on. So she knew my mom before I knew her. Oh. <laughs> Just, I was like ridiculous. So what did she say when you finally phoned? Oh, uh, you know, you a woman yourself. It's like, why are you phoning me? No, that sort of thing. So we, did, we didn't walk the dogs that, that first time. And um, even how we got engaged is even strange, because I was um, filming in, in Iba Island in the far north of Mozambique. And um, we were flying back from uh, Pemba to, to uh, Maputo. And uh, we went through an emergency plane landing. I mean, I was fast asleep in the plane and just just dropped out of the sky. And um, we landed in a place called Nampula. And, and uh, i never forget there were nuns and priests and everyone on the plane. And I mean, you know, LAM can be like flying Russian LAM with chickens on the roof, that sort of thing. Everyone was in the bar, and the only thing that you could drink there was whiskey, and the nuns and the priests, and <laughs> everyone else was in the bar. And I thought about it then, I was like, what was I waiting for? Because we, we'd been together for about three or four or five years. And when I, I got back to Cape Town, I had 2,000 rand left in my bank account. I went and bought a wedding band. I didn't know the difference between an engagement ring and a <laughs> wedding band. And we got home, and I put the ring next to her, and, and I said, this is for you. And she opened it up, and she said, this is very nice. What's this for? And, I, and I'll never forget. I said to her, it's a wedding, an enga a wedding ring doofus. And I mean, it's like the worst <laughs> proposal on the history of the planet. But we've been together for 10 years. She's, um, she's tough. She doesn't take any BS from me. And, um, but she has access to me. And that's the other side. I, I still hold on um, a full-time creative job. So working on the MPO, I need someone who, who has my access to my mind and what's going on and what the vision is and what we've got to drive. And she takes no nonsense from me. Um, I can generally tend to be as slippery as an eel. 
if I, I'm, if I can avoid work, I will. But I, that's human nature as well. <laughs> that's, we all like it. If we can take a shortcut, we'll do it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So what makes it work? The <sighs> fact that she holds her own, it yes. sounds like. Yes. And she comes from an only child, only mom scenario as well. Um, so she's fiercely um, uh, protective of our children, which mm. is, we need that strength. She's smart. Um, she's got my back. Um, sometimes I, I wish I could run away, but you know those women, those strong women in your life are critical. And what does she draw out of you? What do you give her that you give no one else? It's uh, a tough question. Everything. Yeah. Now that's the easy answer. Yeah, I'm going I to insist. <laughs> What do you hide your because you're such a public person and you're constantly out there and interacting with everyone. You know, and, and it's tough. I mean, you know, I go on the road for, for six weeks at, mm. at the, in mid-September again and, and she's got to hold the fort with our children and, and family and things. Whew, Rita, I think, you know, my life is complicated in that I, sometimes I can travel up to six months in a year. I mean, in fact, in my, my first, second, second born's life, I was gone for six months in a year. And um, I think I give her the space to be who she needs to be. Mm. You know? mm. And um, when I am here, I support her. So um, I'm pretty much a hermit nowadays. I never go out. But um, you know, she's, she's going to a, a, an event up in White River for six days. And I'll take the children and look after yeah. them. And yeah, so and it's, it's a weird. full partnership. I know, it has to be. Mm. Um, yeah, and she doesn't take any shit from me, which is important. <laughs> and the kids, what, how have they changed you as a person? Um, Ruda, it's a very different. My oldest is, is turning 21 this year. He's studying environmental science at, at UCT. He was a, an early surprise in my life. He's, you know, I, I've never been able to point fingers at him because I was a reprobate growing up. And, and as, as a parent, you know, I can't, I don't think you can point fingers at them and say, don't do this and don't do that if you've done it yourself. So mm. I'm very frank and honest with him. And um, Gabby and Sam are a little bit more challenging. Um, they're seven and four. And, um, you know, th there's a couple of sayings. Um, life begins at 40. And it used to be life begins at 40 because your children left home when you were in your 40s and suddenly you had, you know, financial freedom and things. But I mean, um, if my kids have kids when I had them, I'll be in my 80s when their children are born. <laughs> That's the honest to God truth. Mm -hmm. Then you add into that the fact that uh, there's some old sayings about it takes a village to bring up a child. And, and in urban environments, it's not that anymore. You know, my mom lives on the wild coast. My dad lives in the east. Eugenie's mom mm -hmm. lives in Johannesburg. Um, our friends have children. And yes, you can support each other on weekends. but. The rest of the time, you're at the coalface looking after your own children. And that side of it is tough. And I, again, I, I often feel I can be a better parent. I, I just, I'm so tired. Every and parent I, feels you, you should be a better parent, parent yeah. I think. Um, but um, Gabby taught me the most about women. I've realized you are like you are from the day you pop out. That's it. Uh, you ingrained. That's who you are genetically. and, and She's taught me to really, I, my nickname for her is the Fury. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, can, I wake up in the morning and she'll, I'll say, Gabby, it's time to get dressed now. We need to go to school. And she'll look at me and she won't even answer me and she won't do anything. And I say, Gabby, please, Gabby, please, Gabby, please, five times. And she won't do anything. You know, she's strong will, just like her mom. Um, they both at, at a Waldorf school, which has been quite an interesting experience for me. Mm. And my oldest went through um, sacks. And um, I don't think we're allowing children enough time to be children. Mm. That's, uh, yeah, so you know, Waldorf is a very different experience. It yeah. is, you know, and my, my sister's son is, is at a traditional um, school and he's reading and writing. My son can hardly write his name, you know, and it's okay. We, you know, mm. children, why must we put them under this pressure that mm. makes them into automations and says, <laughs> you've got to beat this by that age and read. And then the, the, the last thing I want to ask you, um, you're away so often. What mm. do you come home to? What is home? Where is it? What do you, oh, okay. what, why so, did you choose it? Okay, so I live in Nurtuk. And um, we've got a tiny oh, house. Oh, beautiful, huh? Lovely. Yeah. But we've got a tiny house. It's only a um, hundred odd squares. 
but I have a, a 900 square meter garden and um, some time ago I ripped up the front lawn, I don't eat grass, you know, and I put in a full berry cow to permaculture garden. Somewhere we eat about 80% of our, our, our own vegetables. I've got beehives, I've got uh, chickens in the garden. Um, and it's interesting you say that because I think a lot of people treat homes like assets and not like homes. You know, they're mm -hmm. too worried, it must be permit, must look like that, I can't build a wall, I, I must buy this couch for 12 pounds. I just do everything myself. I don't, you know, it's my home. And mm -hmm. if I have a, a vision for my space and my family and things, then I'm going to do it. Mm. So um, it's chaotic, yes. And the, the benches I've made are all a little bit wonky and the bra is slightly off kilter and things, but it's my home. And, uh, you know, um, I invest my own um, skills, time and effort into it and who I am into it. And I, and I expect the same from my own family. We make it our home. And when you, when you stop outside after X weeks away, mm. what does it feel like when you walk in? No, that part's strange really. You know, you, when you travel as much as I do and you live out of a suitcase and, and you, you're taken away from your creature comforts, your family, your home, it's, it's quite difficult to come back into that space and orientate yourself mm. straight away. Um, and fit into the family. It is, and, mm. and there's a bit of, you know, it's great that my kids can talk to me on a phone now. When they couldn't, it was really difficult to communicate mm. to them what I was doing and where I was going. I started taking them on the road with me. Um, before they started going to school, I used to take them on the road with me for six, eight, nine weeks at a time, and that was amazing. I mean, my, my, um, Sam, my, at the time he was four, he used to talk about all these different islands that we had been to, and, and that was a really amazing experience. In fact, um, Michael Palin puts it aptly, he says, the only bug you want to get when you travel is the travel bug, but God <laughs> forbid that you get it, you know, mm. and uh, I think I've installed that in my kids already. But home is, yeah, home is where the heart is, huh? mm. it really is. Um, mm. Three dogs, two chickens, three children, my wife, you know, yeah. and not in that order, please. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, thank you very much for coyering with us. Thank and you. all of the very best, and I hope you find a way to negotiate this change that you want to make in your life. Yeah, you know, thank you. Life's a, a journey, and sometimes you don't know where the next step is going to be or which path you're going mm. to go on. But um, generally, I find it's okay. <laughs> you know, you can get there. Thank very you. good message to end on. Thank you. <laughs> and so, whatever's happening in your life, if it's changing, it's okay. Until next time, goodbye.